today we're going to focus on the word Shema, but before that we'll talk a little bit about the significance of the Shema. Someone was selling a horse, Jewish person obviously, the customer was also Jewish, and he says this horse is very different. If you want the horse to start right, galloping, you have to say Baruch Hashem, thank God. If you want the horse to stop, you say Shema Yisrael. Okay, it's simple enough if you know a little Hebrew, which he did. So he starts to ride the horse, and the horse is galloping faster and faster, and he sees not too far off there's a cliff. And he, he gets very nervous, and he doesn't remember, <laughs> he doesn't remember what he's supposed to say to get the horse to stop. So he realizes that this is going to be the end. What does a Jew say before he dies? Shema Yisrael. And the horse stops just at the edge of the cliff and he says, Ay, Baruch Hashem. <laughs> Shema is a very serious topic. <laughs> it's not to be used for your horse. But it does have an effect on your horse. They say when the Alter Rebbe, the first Chabad Rebbe, left Mizrich, where he studied under the great Hasidic leader of Gov Ber, as Mizrich, he got on the wagon and he heard one of the disciples of the Magid say that you have to, you know, to get the horses to go, you have to whip the horses until they realize that they're horses. And the Alter Rebbe says, I'm going back to Mizrich. Because he realized that this was not teaching him how to ride a horse, but it was teaching him how to ride his own personal horse. So the Shema does have an effect on your horse. The Muranos, they're, actually they should be called conversos. Muranos means something very negative. But many of them converted to Catholicism because they were threatened with death if they didn't and then when they were captured practicing Judaism secretly they would be burnt alive. But this is a story of one of those conversos who was not caught and he's on his deathbed dying a natural death and the bishop comes to administer last rites. But he's a Jew, this, this man, so he turns away from the bishop. He doesn't want to listen to him. He doesn't focus on him. So the bishop realized what was going on, and the bishop whispered in his ears, Shema Yisrael. And the Jew turns around and finishes the verse, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. That's a story that is told. And one final story, or the one before the final story, <laughs> Uh, there were two wealthy landowners in Russia and they would have different types of entertainment and they were getting very bored so they decide you know what we're gonna do each one go back home find a real wild animal find one in the zoo or whatever and we'll put the animals together and we'll have a the animals combat each other <clears throat> so one of them goes back home and he can't find any wild animals so he tells one of his Jewish workers, he says, Mushka, he says, he says, I want you to get dressed up like a lion. And then the Jew can't say no. He comes to the contest, they open up the, the gate, and then he sees this fierce tiger coming out from the other side. And of course, what do you do when you know your life is about to end? You cry out, Shema Yisrael. And the tiger responds, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchus Olavad. One other story. I was once on a JetBlue flight. You know, everyone is reading about mishaps occurring on planes. Well, this is one that happened on JetBlue about 15 years ago or so. And I'm sitting next to a Jewish student, a UB student. 
And uh, based on my conversation with him, he didn't seem to know too much about Judaism. I remember the, uh, said the altitude of the plane was 613. So I said to him, uh, isn't that interesting? Do you know what 613 is? And he said, no. So that's the number of mitzvahs in the Torah. Ah, he was like very uh, surprised. He never knew that before. So I can see that he was pretty ignorant of Jewish uh, teachings. To make a long story short, this is a long story, uh, as we get up into the air, the pilot gets on the loudspeaker and says there's a little problem, minor problem, that the wheels didn't go back inside. And therefore, we're going to have to fly at a lower altitude and we're going to have to go at a lower speed. So I thought, okay, it'll take another 15 minutes, big deal. Then as we're uh, traveling, it says the speed was 358. I said to the student, what is 358? And he says, I have no idea. Well, this most people wouldn't know. And I said, that's the numerical value of the word Mashiach. And he was like, oh, nice to hear that. And I remember saying, I think this is going to be an interesting flight. <laughs> I didn't realize how interesting it would be because as we got closer to the destination, to Kennedy Airport, the pilot gets on and he says, you know what? Uh, we don't know if the wheels are straight or crooked. If they're crooked, we're going to have to have a crash landing. We'll only know as we get closer to the airport and other planes will be able to tell us if the wheels are straight or crooked. And uh, meanwhile, you have to prepare for a crash landing. And he, the pilot says, I've been flying planes for 20 years. This is once in a lifetime experience. <laughs> you can imagine the confidence everyone had. <laughs> <laughs> meanwhile, I, I was sitting in the aisle seat. The student was sitting in the window seat. And I noticed, I didn't notice, but he told me, because I was looking in his direction, he was looking towards the outside, that people were crying. Tears were streaming down people's faces. And I turned to him, and I see him crying as well. And he's reciting Shema Yisrael. Here's a student who knew very little about Judaism. But I wasn't saying Shema Yisrael. He was saying it. So but thank God the plane landed safely, and a few explosions occurred, but everyone got out <laughs> safely. Let's talk a little bit about the history of the Shema. Where did it come from? Well, we, we just said it's a verse in Deuteronomy. Yes, but according to our sages, according to the Talmud and the Midrash, it actually goes back before that. And that's text one. Jacob is now on his deathbed and he surrounds himself with all his children and he wants to bless them. And he feels that somehow the divine presence was not with him. He didn't feel inspired. So the first thing he imagined was, you know what, maybe my kids are not following in the footsteps of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, myself. What did Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob do to change the whole world was to promote the idea of monotheism, one God. And now his kids, he feels maybe they have abandoned that belief, that core belief. And because of that, that's why he lost his inspiration. So you know what his kids said to him? when he told them what his concerns were, they said, Shema Yisrael. Jacob had another name. What was his other name? Yisrael, Israel. They said to him, Shema, listen, Israel, you, Israel, our father. Hashem Elokeinu, God is our God. The same God that you have, he's also our God. He is one God. We have not abandoned your belief. And he responded with the words, Baruch Shem Kavod, blessed is the name of God's glorious kingdom forever and ever. That was his response. It's one of the reasons we don't say it out loud because that's not mentioned in the Torah. That's mentioned in the oral tradition as not to equate it with the verse in the Torah. We say it quietly. That's one of the reasons anyhow. Another example, another source where the Shema was said, when Joseph harnessed his chariot and he went up to meet Israel, his father, to Goshen, and he appeared to him, and he fell on his neck, and he wept on his neck for a long time. Joseph is now reunited with his father and weeping in this reunion, tears of joy. So the Midrash says, Jacob, however, 
neither fell on Joseph's neck, he didn't embrace him, nor kissed him. Our sages said that he was reciting the Shema, which of course is very, very strange. Here a father, his beloved child, who he mourned and grieved for so many years, and now he meets him, and his son is all over him, embracing him and crying, and he's saying, I'm sorry, I'm saying the Shema. What was going on over there? Keep that question in the back of your mind. We'll get to it in, event, in the other classes. Now, Shema itself, they translate it as Hear, O Israel. But it has many different translations. Some are literal, some are more creative. First meaning is Hear, O Israel. And we'll talk today about hearing. Then there's also listening or perceiving, absorbing. Then there's obeying. Then there's understanding or meditating. These are all legitimate translations. Another one is gathering. Gather Israel. What does that mean? Well, we'll get to that also eventually. Then there's one that's not obviously a translation, but it's a composite of two words. Shema has a shin mem, which is shem, which means name. And then the letter ayin, the name of 70. Again, that's very cryptic. The name of 70, 70, the number, the name of 70. We'll have to discuss that as well. And it's also an acronym. There's three words, biblical words. Su'u, marom, enechem. Su means lift up, marom, to the heavens, enechem, your eyes. And the end of the verse is, and you shall see who created all of these. In the Torah itself, when Moses addresses the Jews, he uses the word Shema several times, listen, hear, whatever, and he also uses the word see. They use interchangeably, but there are different meanings. And we're going to focus on the meaning of Shema as opposed to Re'e, see. You have to hear the words. You can't just meditate. When you say the Shema, you can't just look at the prayer book, if you know it by heart, you can't just think the words. You have to verbalize them, vocalize them. You have to hear what you're saying. Literally hear. Forget about all the deeper meanings. Literally you have to hear. Because hearing is a very important part of being human. Most civilizations, and that's a very important part of being Jewish. Most civilizations throughout history were visual visual cultures. The pagans, they worshipped sun, the moon, the stars, the things that you could see with your eyes. The Greeks glorified art, architecture, theater, sculpture, the human body, the physical body. Today, what do people do? They watch, or the, uh, the internet, they're on the computer, they watch movies, YouTube, MeTube, TheyTube. Judaism is primarily audio, not visual. God tells us, you didn't see anything at Sinai. You heard. You didn't see. There's a very big difference. There's very little visual art in Judaism. You know, we didn't contribute that much to art over the ages because everything in the field of art in the ancient times were revol revolved around religion. You know, the church, the, the, uh, they, they, of course, depicted different uh, things, uh, angels, saints, and so on and so forth. And that's where their art came from. Jewish religion didn't have much art, art to, uh, to depict. Very little visual art in the religious realm of Judaism. And what's our primary piece of architecture? A wall. A fragment of a wall. Nothing, nothing exotic, nothing exciting about that wall if we look at it from a point of view of art. You know, it's, it's an impressive wall, of course, but it's, there's nothing compared to the beautiful structures of, of, of the Greeks, of the Romans, of antiquity. If you look in the Talmud, the Talmud, almost every page will introduce an argument with the words Ta Shema, Aramaic for come and hear, Aramaic same thing as in Hebrew. Ta means come, shema, hear. Shema mean enough. We want to say we can prove something. We say shema 
mina. You can hear from this. If you want to say there's an inference, mashma, it implies the hear the idea of hearing is so so clear. If you want to connect to something spiritual, it cannot be seen. You have to use your mind, your more refined and more subtle senses. Story of the teacher in the Soviet Union, and he says to his kids, you see the tree outside? Yeah. You know, it's, you know there's a tree. Do you see the ceiling? Yes. Because there is a ceiling. And then he says, do you see God? No. Then there is no God. So one of the students says to the other students, do you see the teacher's brain? No. Then there is no brain. <laughs> we had a guest a number of years ago who were working for the State Department in Nigeria. Work Americans who uh, worked in Nigeria and whenever they had to take care of medical needs they would fly to London they wouldn't go to the local doctors why because the local doctor would have a needle that he would use for everyone the same needle without sterilizing it and he would mock those who questioned him and he would say you're so primitive look at the needle do you see any demons on the point of the needle there's nothing there it's perfectly safe I don't know how many people he killed, but certainly no one was in their right mind was going to use that doctor. So who is more primitive, the person who sees things clearly or the person who has to hear about them and process them in his own mind? Hearing is the key to proper understanding and to truth. Not seeing. Seeing is not a sign of truth unless it's preceded by hearing. That's where we're going to find out that, yes, Judaism does have a lot of, to say about seeing, in fact, it says in the Messianic age, we will see godliness. But that's after hearing, then seeing enhances it and deepens it. But if you start your, your, your life with the visual, and that's one of the problems, I think, with education today, that everything is so visual, they don't have time to process anything in their own minds. That's something that has to be dealt with in the educational system. You can't see love. You can't see compassion. You can't see honesty. You can only discuss it. Of course, you could act lovingly, but you can't see the, 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 the emotion of love. And that's why, as Rob just pointed out, one of the reasons, there are a few reasons, we cover our eyes when we say the Shema. Simple reason is not to be distracted. You want to focus, you want to concentrate. But the deeper reason is, you don't want to be affected by the visual. You want to focus on what you hear and not on what you see. Because what you see is not reality. What you hear has a chance of being reality, has a chance of being true and being honest. There was a story of a drunk, a drunkard, Jewish drunkard, who would drink till he would become totally intoxicated and he would just lie in the street lie in his vomit wake up and drink some more so finally the people in the community decided to have some fun at his expense so what do they do one time that he got drunk they picked him up they brought him into the shul they took off his rags they dressed him like a rabbi, put on a kapota, a long black coat, with a rabbinic hat, a white shirt and a tie, everything that... And they sat him down in the rabbi's chair in front of a lectern with a big volume of the Talmud sitting there. And he wakes up and he looks around and he says, where am I? And he realizes he's in a shul. And he looks at himself. And he says, what's this? I'm dressed like a rabbi. He says, I don't remember being a rabbi. And he scratches his head. And then he says, you know what? Maybe I am a rabbi. You know, garments don't lie. 
or do they? So he uh, says, oh, obviously, if I'm sitting in the rabbi's chair and I'm dressed like a rabbi, I must be a rabbi. But then he says, no, it couldn't be. <laughs> How can I be a rabbi? I don't have any memory of ever studying. I'm illiterate. I, I, I never went to school. And I, all my life, I just drink. So I can't possibly be a rabbi. Okay, I'm not a rabbi. But then he says, one second. If I'm not a rabbi, what am I doing here dressed like a rabbi? And he's going back and forth until finally he comes on this brilliant idea. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to open up the volume of the Talmud. If I could read it and understand it, then I must be a rabbi. If I can't, then I'm not a rabbi. So he opens up the volume and he, didn't, he couldn't read it. He didn't know how to read Hebrew and he certainly couldn't understand it. And he turns pages, nothing helps. He says, okay, now I know I'm not a rabbi. Then a few minutes later, he says, well, one second. But if I'm not a rabbi, why am I dressed like one? And why am I in the shul sitting in the rabbi's chair? You know what he said? I am a rabbi. The fact that I couldn't read the Talmud is because none of them know how to read the Talmud. <laughs> they tell a story of Chelm, of uh, a guy who is on a train. And those trains, you had compartments where you slept in at night. And uh, he uh, tells the conductor, wake me up at this and this time, because when we get to this station, because that's where I have to get off. And the conductor says, sure, I'll wake you up. And he gets undressed. He puts his clothing down near his compartment, and he goes to sleep. Meanwhile, a general gets on the train, and he's in the next compartment. And he also goes to sleep, and he takes off his clothing, his uniform, and he puts it down next to where the Chelmite had his clothing. Well, six in the morning, the conductor wakes up the Chelmite, and the Chelmite, it's still dark outside in the winter, so he doesn't see what he's doing, so he puts on the uniform of the general, not realizing that it was not his. And then he comes home, and his wife looks at him and says, what's going on here? He says, what do you mean? He says, you're dressed like a general. And he goes to the mirror, and lo and behold, he has a uniform on with the medals and everything. He says, oh, those dumb conductors. <laughs> he woke up the general instead of me. <laughs> so, we are the drunkards, or the Chalmites. You take your pick. And we are so exposed to the superficial. We, we only could see, if we look like we're wearing the uniform of a general, then we must be the general. If we're looking like a rabbi, we must be a rabbi. We, we have such false impressions of who we are and what the world around us is like. When you say the Shema, the first thing, forget about the deeper meanings, the first <coughs> word already allows you to penetrate the cover and say, Shema, open your ears. Stop focusing on what your eyes see and deceive you. Because your eyes will tell you you're something you're not. The eyes will tell you that the world around you is something it isn't. See is important. But if you want to get deeper into life, if you want to appreciate the real meaning of life, Shema, open up your ears. What your ears should hear is important, obviously. You can't just hear everything that is around there. There's a, there's a, it's a cacophony of, of sounds, and you have to be able to sort them out to hear the symphony rather than the cacophony. But the first step is hearing. We're going to get to other steps of listening, understanding, gathering. Those are all deeper levels. But you can't get to the deeper levels without first opening your ears to hear.